Welcome to the Well Workshops by Udefine Wellness. I'm Denise O'Malley, the founder of Udefine Wellness, and uh, we are delighted to have you with us here today for this very, very special episode that we have put together, this very special workshop. Peggy Green is the founder of Be Grief Specialist in Highlands Ranch, Colorado. Um, Peggy belongs to a club none of us want to belong to, and that is the loss of a child. And she has experienced from, um, I'm going to just share it, if you don't mind, Peggy, 30 years ago, her, um, her young daughter passed away. And then in 2018, her son um, died by suicide, Connor. And with, through her grief, she channeled it into this phenomenal company called The Grief Specialist. And she has even written a book called Life After Child Loss. Peggy, it is a delight and an honor to have you presenting today and sharing um, how to survive suicide loss with all who are with us. Yeah. Thank you so much, Denise. I, I do appreciate it. And, you know, not only being 9-11, but September also is Suicide Prevention and Awareness Month. And so, you know, as we're recognizing and acknowledging that, I thought this was just a really an appropriate day for us to be able to address this topic because it's growing suicides and the result of the worldwide events that we're experiencing. So I'm just so grateful that I am here today. And so, you know, as we're doing this, I'm, I'm, this is, like I said, a worldwide event. And where are you coming from? What state, what country, where do we have people coming from? So I see, do see that we have some from, um, you know, Colorado and, oh, I see I've got somebody from Texas and Fresno, California. I've got people from across the, all over, oh, Wisconsin. So thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. And so what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to share my story a little bit more in depth. And Denise, thank you so much for sharing my story in that short capsule, but so let me start with this. I was driving home on a Friday night, and we'll be waiting on that one just a minute, Denise, um, on a Friday night in rush hour traffic. And I was lost in traffic thinking about Christmas, only a few weeks away. Christmas is my favorite, favorite time of year. And ever since my divorce, Christmas mornings are even more meaningful. The joy, the laughter. We have this homemade Swedish tea rings that the girls and I make. And coffee and orange juice for breakfast. And it's our guaranteed family time together, Christmas mornings. My kids, even as young adults, would stay and camp over just to be there for Christmas morning. So my thoughts were interrupted when my phone rang. It was my oldest daughter. Rather than hearing her say hello, I heard her say, he hasn't been feeling well lately. And that was just someone else in the room. Immediately, I knew she was talking about her brother, my son, Connor. They worked at car dealerships next to each other and were often found spending time in each other, showrooms helping each other, hanging out with each other. I yelled out to her through the phone, but she didn't answer. And my heart started racing. Mother's instinct kicked in and told me something was wrong. I hung up the phone, called her back. She immediately answered. I could tell she was upset. She could barely utter through tears and sobs the next few sentences. Mom, I just don't know how to tell you this, but Connor, Connor is dead. He killed himself. I hit that steering wheel with both hands and yelled out, how, how could this be happening? Why was this happening? I had that flashback of, 28 years earlier when my nine-month-old daughter passed away. I already endured the loss of one child. Why, oh, why, oh, why, oh, why? And to this day, I can so vividly recall the pain, the questions, and the suffering in the beginning of both children, even after two and a half, three years. And so from that point forward, I would not only be the mother who's lost a child, but I would be known as a bereaving mom and a suicide loss survivor. Hi, I'm Peggy Green, author, speaker, grief coach, and mom. I have three children, 
I have four children, three girls and one boy. And so it was not easy to understand why I was going through a second child's death, especially by suicide. I was in a dark place without an answer, then it came to me. It took over a year to get my answer. I've been called to help others through this experience. And that's one where, place where my book came from, Life After Child Loss, The Mother Survival Guide to Cope and Find Joy. I started speaking on child loss and suicide, and I combined my experience as a fitness coach, nutrition coach, consultant and wellness instructor and grieving and healing mom together to become a grief coach. So um, Denise, we can go ahead and pop in that next one. So I want to welcome everyone here to today's workshop, managing your suicide, surviving your suicide. And so I really want to reiterate in these days when we're so busy and caught up, I want you to set your intentions to get the most out of your experience here today. Okay? Learn from this. You're already going through some trauma and set this time aside. So a few ways that you can really dedicate this to your own healing is ask yourself, what do I want to learn today? Two, in order to learn, do you have pen and paper? Take notes. We don't remember things. There's so much going on. Number three. Decide you want to be fully present. Get rid of your other distractions, the cell phone, the notifications, okay? And to learn, you can participate in the group conversation activities. We learn from each other. And really decide, do you want to learn some tips how to manage the loss of your loved one by suicide? So it's an interactive workshop. I'm not here just to babble on. I'll be asking questions throughout the workshop and so here's your opportunity to um, really engage. And like I said, some community learning. So just to do a quick tech check, I want to just make sure everybody it can hear me. And if you can hear me, just raise your hand in the chat box. Okay, I see some hands popping in. Yeah, that's wonderful. Some more hands. Yes, thank you. So now that you have set your intentions, complete a check, tech check, we can get started. I believe that what a suicide loss survivor wants most is hope. And here we are is to move through grief and have hope of peace, joy, and happiness. I have walked in your shoes. Death of a child is unique. You understand that. It changes your total being from the core. I get it. Been the grieving mom for 30 years. I've also been a healing mom for 30 years. And I have people ask me, Peggy, when should I start the healing process? And really my answer is immediately. It doesn't have to be that big step though. So let's compare that to a broken arm. If you were to fall down and break your arm, you don't wait for weeks before you go to the emergency room, see the orthopedic doctor, get a cast and do that follow-up. You start immediately. So this is the same thing. So your treatment or your recovery is based on your current condition and it comes in phases. So when I broke my wrist, I went to the ER, had diagnostics tests, then went home. Later, I went to the orthopedic doctor and was casted. So start immediately with work through your grief. That's talking with others, journaling. So I want to say that is why you're here is to take those steps. You're already taking a step. So we're gonna spend the next two hours together. We'll have the workshop and then we'll have questions. So this workshop has two sections. In the first part, I help you understand the complexities, messiness and complications that arise as a result of losing a loved one to suicide. In the second part, I'll be sharing the same tools and techniques that I have personally used to get me through every day with peace, joy and happiness. Denise, we can pop up that next one. So we're going to dive into those complexities. I don't know about you, but after Connor died, I started researching suicide. I wanted answers and found they provided some relief to my anguish. Through my research and own experience, I did get answers. And my research consisted of 
looking in his Facebook messages, his cell phone texts, pictures, voicemails. I spent time talking, well, maybe more like interrogating friends and family that were with him days and weeks before he passed. What clues did they have? What did they see? What did he tell them? I spent months in this insane investigation mode. I wanted and demanded answers. And really, if you have done anything similar to what I just described, raise your hand in the chat box. You're not alone. There are others who have gone down this road. Oh yes, I see those hands going up for sure. We all want answers. So after all my investigation was complete, I felt like Sherlock Holmes looking for the who, what, when, where, how, and why, and no stones were left unturned. So I wanna share with you what I turned up. So who dies by suicide? It is our loved ones, brothers, fathers, sons, sisters, mothers, daughters, and grandparents. It could be the mom, the single mom. It could be the dad at the factory. And it could be the executive or it could be the homeless person on the streets. So I want to take a moment and honor your loved one. So in the chat box, feel free to type in their names. I'll start with Connor. I also had a niece. Casey. So I have others in here. And Sam. Yes. And Tom. Yes. Take a few minutes and remember them. Philip. Yes. We're free to talk about them. Serena. Yes. Take a moment and remember your loved one. Harry. Deb, Melissa, yes, thank you. On to our next one. Suicide affects all ages. It is the second leading cause of death for people 30, 10 to 34, the fourth leading cause for ages 34 to 54, and the fifth leading cause among ages 45 to 54. The risk of suicide varies greatly by age, sex, race, and by personal characteristics, including education, occupation, family history, and place of residence. Simply put, suicide knows no boundaries. It happens to everyone. So what is suicide? Suicide is defined as death caused by self-directed injurious behavior with intent to die as a result of that behavior. I wanna share this piece with you. Suicide is not an act of selfishness, weakness, or cowardness. And I'm going to repeat this. I think this is one of the basic principles in understanding and helping you to move through this. Suicide is not an act of selfishness, weakness, or cowardness. Next slide. And when do most suicides occur? And this might surprise you. We've been led to believe that suicide increases with holidays and days getting shorter. Uh, contrary, research shows the opposite. Seasonal effects on suicide suggest that there's more suicide during late spring and early summer months. And then where do suicides occur? Next slide. Well, about three quarters of suicides incidents occur at home. And for those who don't occur at home, there are popular locations throughout the world for taking one's life. And the three leading sites for suicide is one, the Golden Gate Bridge in California. Second is Humber Bridge and East Yorkshire and North Lincolnshire, which is in London, England. And third is Sunshine Skyway Bridge in Florida in the USA. And next slide, Denise. And how does suicide occur? occur? What are the methods used? So in my research, the methods of suicide actually really surprised me. 
maybe it's because the multiple suicide losses I've been through and experienced or by the means which my son ended his life because it's like, oh, that's the way he died and that must be the most popular way. But actually, firearms are now used in more suicides than homicides, making it the fastest growing method, nearly 60% of all suicides. Next, the method in which my son did die is through hanging, and that comprises 20% of suicides, hanging, suffocation, and strangulation. Next is solid and liquid poisons, and that does include overdoses, and that's about 10%. Gas poisons are 6%, and the balance of those are completed by jumping from high places like those bridges I mentioned, moving into fast moving objects, burns, fires, and even intentional crashing of motor vehicles. Next slide. So why, why, why? If you recall, that's what I was asking. This is the million dollar question. So this list, gives you some potential reasons. It doesn't cover everything. I just can't do that because there's so many reasons, but this will give you at least something that you can grasp onto and help to understand that why. So as I'm speaking for the next few minutes, please feel free to share in the chat box the reason you feel your loved one took their life. Now, circumstances are different, Yet there are so many similarities. So often, suicide is the result of long-term difficulties with thoughts, feelings, or experiences that the individuals feel they cannot bear any longer. Here's some of those reasons that are popping in. Financial, feeling like no one understood. No one loved them. Physical, physical pain, yes. So many factors contribute to a person feeling this way. It may be due to events happening in life, tired of living. Oh gosh, more reasons. So I wanna thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. The one that, thing that I found that all of those who've died have in common, that those that, and I learned this from those who have attempted suicide because they were in a lot of pain physically, and mentally. And all they wanted to do was in the pain, it was not to so as much in their life, it was to end the pain. And the only way to end the pain was to end their life. Now, while you may do your best to understand and answer the question why, the fact is you will never know the 100% truth. I wish this were different. This is so hard so difficult to accept. There are more questions. Why didn't they reach out to you? Why didn't you see it coming? The canyon of why. So, so many whys. Know that asking why is normal and that at first it may feel impossible that you will ever get beyond that question, but eventually you will find a way of thinking that you can accept or live with. And I believe that's another reason why you are here today. So that's part one, helping you to understand the complexities, messiness, and complications associated with suicide. The who, what, when, where, how, and why. Now it's time to help you navigate your loss through the four areas of health. So we're going to stop with that or start with that. And th these four areas of health are your physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual health. Now, this is a holistic approach to grief and healing. I am not a licensed grief coach, a grief counselor, or therapist. Everything that I teach you comes with practical self-experience. So these are all very interconnected and they will help you to heal and help you to find that hope and have peace, joy, and happiness. So you can also consider these four areas a way of thinking about it as self-care. So you ask, what is self-care? Self-care is what you deliberately do for your well-being. So in this section, you are focusing on your physical 
health. We're going to talk a little bit more about nutrition because our physical health and nutrition is the most often ignored, denied, and disregarded in grief. It is an important piece though in your recovery and you shouldn't overlook it though. So I want you to take a moment and think about the symptoms of mental health caused by grief and just kind of note how many. So you can put you know, on your paper hash marks or write it down. Um, we're still on physical. So poor physical health symptoms caused by grief may include migraines, fatigue, nausea, inability to eat, insomnia, weight gain or weight loss, chronic pain, arthritis, bloating, stroke, high blood pressure. You may experience more colds or flus or a new diagnosis of autoimmune disease or even cancer. No way getting around it. Grief impacts our physical health. So I said, note how many. So if you wanna just put in that chat box, how many you noted, it could be one, it could be two, it could be five, or even ones that I didn't list. But noting that how many of these have come up since you've been experiencing grief? Three, okay, yes, oh my, five, yes, and eight, oh wow. So we see how grief can manifest itself. So you're not alone in feeling that grief has impacted your health. And as I said, we're going to talk about grief and nutrition and how it impacts your physical body and your mental and emotional state of grief. I'll give you some specific examples of some simple and easy changes you can implement. <clears throat> so nutrition is our first cornerstone within that physical health. <clears throat> There are so many aspects of physical health that I want to share all of them because coming from that personal training realm, I know the degree of exercise. However, in the essence of time, I can only share about the nutrition today. If you're interested in learning more, please schedule time with me so you can reach out to me and um, we'll get my email address in there. So as we're talking about the nutrition, it's in those times of stress. It is extremely easy to get easy to grab cookies or chips and use food as a way to make you feel better. Now they affect your blood sugar, energy level, and your mental focus. Processed foods also affect your gut health. Think about this. Your gut is considered to be your second brain, which is also responsible for controlling your mental and emotional wellness. So you see what you eat, affects the gut and the gut turns around and affects the um, mental and emotional wellness. Do you see that connection and your grief? I want to share with you what taking care of your gut looks like through nutrition. Ultimately, the goal is to follow this as closely as possible. However, do give yourself some grace if you do not. Nutrition is about health and wellness as part of your grief and healing. Now, when feeling stressed or grieved, anxious or sad, focus on keeping up with, with a well-balanced diet. So I like to give you seven components to this. So you will add more real food and water, eliminate gluten and dairy, and reduce caffeine, alcohol, and sugar. So we'll start with the first two suggestions in which you are adding to your diet. Time of stress and grieving causes the body to be inflamed, causing pain and possible stomach issues. We agree that grief is stressful, right? So eating real food will reduce that inflammation. And real food does not come in boxes, cans, or microwave containers. It comes from the earth. It is recommended to eat nine to 13 servings of fruits and vegetables per day to reduce that inflammation. And so I'm just curious, and those serving size are the size of your fist. So how many servings of fruits and vegetables are you getting out of those nine to 13? Put that in the chat box. Let's see how you're doing. And in grief, I really recommend eating more than you are. It will help. Okay, we have three to four in there. 
Oh, three, two, in seven. Okay, so we have it across the board, but I don't see anybody reaching those nine to 13 servings. Now, I understand eating may be difficult, let alone eating more fruits and vegetables. So that's why I've been taking plant powder, fruits and vegetables in a capsule for years. And I doubled up on them the day after my son died. And the reason why I did that is my father passed away shortly after a stressful life event from cancer. My sister passed away shortly after a stressful life event with cancer. And losing my son is very stressful. And I wanted to make sure that I did everything to reduce the risk of contracting cancer because I still have two beautiful girls and grandson, granddaughter, and other family that I want to live for. So those fruits and vegetables in capsule make it easy for me to get the vitamins and minerals and antioxidants to help repair the damage caused by grief. It's been easy for me to do, and I've managed to maintain my health in this time. And again, if you want more information about that, I'll be happy to share that with you as well. So we're going to talk about water as the next component of nutrition. Now, heads up, I think this is one of the easiest ones to start up with. And I want to also share dehydration is a special danger for bereaved loved ones. Your body's 80% water, and when you do not replenish what you use, you can get headaches, fatigue, and have difficulty thinking. Now, drinking water will help reduce these symptoms and more as well. So your body produces toxins from stress, stress from grief, that need to be flushed out. The only way to get rid of them is to drink water. And I mean water. Coffee, teas, sodas, or alcohol do not replace water. So here's how you determine how much water to be drinking. And this is something that you can start right away. Drink one half your body weight in ounces of water. And this is how you calculate it. So take your weight, and I'm going to use the example of 120 pounds, give, divide 120 by two, and your answer is 60. 60 ounces of water is what your body requires at a minimum to stay hydrated, functioning, and helping to flush those toxins and focus. One half your body weight in ounces of water. Here's your next question in the chat box, indicate with a yes or no if you're drinking one half your body weight in ounces of water. No, 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 no. Close, but not quite. Okay, that's good. And a yes. Okay, a lot more no's. So it's easy to do. And I get a water bottle and carry that with me and it's 24 ounces. And I know that if I drink at least three of those, then guess what? I have exceeded the amount that I need or even have water with me when I'm working at my desk, okay? It's easy to do. And the next three recommendations now are what I suggest you remove from your diet. So we're gonna talk about taking gluten out of your diet. We hear so much about gluten. Gluten and its byproducts are commonly found in processed foods such as bread, pasta, pizza, cereals, and other snack food. That stuff that's easy for us to grab, that we have a tendency to gravitate to when we're grieving. But gluten in those products is inflammatory. Remember, we want to reduce our inflammation and we want to really keep it down to a minimum not increase it. And gluten can also be responsible for stomach pain, brain fog, or we've heard it called grief brain, increased um, fatigue, higher risk of autoimmune diseases, and may even contribute to depression. We also want to eliminate dairy. We want to eliminate it because it still gets the stress hormone cortisol from the cows. 
and we produce cortisol in our grief and we don't want to add more layers of cortisol. We don't need to absorb it. Our body doesn't need more. It, dairy is also a source of inflammation. We're not as humans meant to have dairy products, have milk from another species. We're supposed to have milk, human milk. Okay, so we want to keep that inflammation down. Next, we're going to talk about reducing caffeine. And some people turn to caffeine for energy. It can offer that short-term burst, but caffeine can also increase your blood pressure. And someone who is grieving can already be experiencing elevated blood pressure, palpitations, and it's dangerous to add to it with the use of stimulants from caffeine. Caffeine is also a diuretic, which will increase your risk of dehydration. And remember, we need to be drinking half your body weight in ounces of water. Don't use coffee, tea, or sodas. So if you'd have a cup of coffee, if it's eight ounces, then you need to have 16 ounces of water to replace that. And then we want to move into reducing or eliminating alcohol. I really suggest taking alcohol out of your consumption while you're really in the depths of mourning. So losing a loved one by suicide is certainly one of the most upsetting and painful experiences one can have. The use of alcohol will numb your emotions. However, during the grieving process, it is critical that you experience and express those feelings and emotions. It is part of healing. And there's no form of self-medicating with alcohol or substances that will effectively erase the pain of loss and only masks it. And we're going to reduce, our last one is to reduce or eliminate sugar. It's also responsible for lack of energy. You get that high, then it comes down and you have a big drop. It can cause agitation, weight gain, more cortisol, weakening of your immune system, and adds to mood swings, depression, and grief brain. So you see how our nutrition? So a quick tip for women is to limit your sugar intake to 25 grams of sugar per day. Now, it's very easy to exceed that. A 20 ounce bottle of Coca-Cola Classic contains 65 grams of sugar, which is 40 grams above the daily recommended allowance. So with just one Coke, you've exceeded the recommended allowance of sugars. I understand reducing your sugar seems like an insurmountable task. However, it will help in your grief. And then I want you to think twice before grabbing a soda, candy bar, or bag of chips. Instead, grab a handful of cut veggies with hummus. Find other alternatives. So give yourself all the fighting power that you can to help yourself to move through your loss. You do not have to be perfect. Give yourself some grace in what you're doing. Take a few of these ideas per week, and in a few months, you will look back and see that you have navigated your grief with more energy, less brain fog, and better sleep. So I've given you what I have today about nutrition and the importance in your grief healing. Let's turn to mental health, which is our second physical component. Thank you. So allow me to offer a short definition about mental health. It's your cognition, beliefs, thoughts, and edicts you live by with peace of mind and happiness. Mental health is the stories you tell yourself to make sure you survive and are safe. So here's some signs of poor mental health. Poor mental health is also known as mental illness, but refers to a wide range of conditions and disorders that affect your mood, thinking, behavior. There are five basic categories of mental illness, depression, anxiety disorder, addictive behavior, eating disorders, and schizophrenia. So it's crucial to assess, look where you currently are if you feel you've got some mental illness. It's important to address them and open up space in your healing to grieve. It's tough to move through when you're experiencing mental illness. They're not meant to be taken lightly. If you feel you are experiencing the symptoms of mental illness, please see a medical provider. 
And the good news is that these mental health illnesses are not a part of the normal grieving process. So you don't have to expect them. Plenty of people survive the loss of a loved one without experiencing them. I was talking with a friend and he asked me if suicide grief was harder than other types of loss. And I took a moment to answer this question because I have personally struggled with why I feel different in my grief in between my nine month old who died in a daycare accident and my 24 year old, year -old son who took his life. And I concluded that suicide bereavement is not harder because there's no comparison between cancer, illness, or accidental death. All, all of it is hard. But what I did tell him is that child loss by suicide had its own incredibly unique set of challenges. It's messy, complicated, and different than other modalities of death. Unfortunately, too often, it is easy to focus on how our loved one died rather than how they lived. In fact, your loved one is much more than how they died. So right now, we're going to do an exercise to help you change that story, change how you see how they died, and help you to move through your grief. So how do you get through this? How do you stop focusing on how they died? You change the stories you're telling yourself. Remember, it's an interactive workshop, so be sure to have your pen and paper ready. This is an exercise that anyone can do. Once you have your pen and paper handy, please raise your hand in the chat box. We're going to take a few minutes to do this exercise. Take a drink of water, grab your paper, and I'm starting to see some hands. Okay, wonderful, great. Okay, wonderful. Denise, if you wanna go with that next slide. Okay, so in the center of your paper, draw a circle about the size of a half dollar in the center of that, write your loved one's name. And then in another circle next to it, write the word suicide. Hold that paper up and look at it. What do you see? You see their name and the word suicide. Now put your paper back down. Next. The next is to draw about 20 circles. Denise, we can pop onto the next one. To draw about 20 circles around those two circles. In those circles, put attributes about your loved one. They can be physical, such as eye color, height, weight, just different things that you can put on there. In your next slide, Denise. Now, adding more in there, add their personality, their values, their strengths, their hobbies. Fill in those circles with things about your loved one. And do not feel limited by 20 circles. Okay? You can fill all those circles in. We'll get you started, and then you can complete this afterwards. And then you can add friends and family and relationships that you have. And I think we have one more slide with that, Denise, with the circles. And now that your circles are filled in with good attributes of your loved one, pick up that sheet of paper and look at it. And what do you see now? You see all these things about your loved one, not just their name and not just the word suicide. You are seeing them as a whole person and not focusing on how they died. Your person was more than how they died. So if you'll do me a favor in the chat box, please share how helpful this has been using. On a scale of one to 10, one being it didn't, and 10, it helped you tremendously. I know that one of my clients that this made a huge difference in being able to focus. Oh, a nine, this is great, a 10, thank you. Huge difference on how you think about it. Thank you. Thank you now. And we will move into our emotional health and grief. So it's our third physical, our third health. So what is emotional health? It's one aspect of mental health. So if emotional health is part of mental health, why are we looking at its own? Well, emotional health focuses on being in tune with our emotions, 
vulnerability and authenticity, says a licensed psychologist, Julie Draga. Having good emotional health is a fundamental aspect of fostering resilience, self-awareness, and overall contentment. This is something that you may be struggling with since losing your loved one. I'm going to dispel a myth about your emotions. There are no positive or negative emotions. Only feel good or feel bad emotions. Think of it this way. If you say being happy is a positive emotion, you judge yourself as it being acceptable. If you say being sad is a negative emotion, then you associate it with doing something wrong. When you think it is wrong to be sad, then you discount your grief and you do not want to take away from that feeling of your emotions. So from here on out, I will refer to emotions as feel goods or feel bads. So I want you to write some emotions in the chat box that help you feel good. Share some of those. So emotional health does not always mean happy. It does mean you're aware of your emotions and can determine if they are good or bad. Emotionally healthy people still experience stress, anger, and sadness. The difference is they know how to navigate them either on their own or with a professional such as myself. So we have laughing, doing something for somebody else, sitting quietly in nature. I like that. Thank you. So why do we want to seek good emotional health in grief? It is important because stress caused by grief can make you more vulnerable to physical illnesses, such as the colds and flus, more frequency and greater intensity. So circling back around, we're connecting the dots in between emotional health and physical health. As someone who is grieving, you are aware of your good and bad emotions. So let's take a good look at what good emotional health looks like. This is an area to work towards. So here's some signs and symptoms of that good emotional health. So those who are emotionally healthy are in control of their thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. You're able to cope with life's challenges, can keep problems in perspective and bounce back from setbacks. Feel good about yourself and have good relationships. So paths to improving your emotional health. It actually is a learned skill. There are many ways to improve or maintain emotional health and grief. First of all, understand that the bad feelings are temporary and you will notice changes in them as you progress in your healing. So really creating that awareness of your emotions and your reactions. Pay attention to what triggers them. So write it down, then seek a way to navigate that situ situation or event using the tools you're gaining in this workshop. So you want to express your feelings in a healthy way. Do not hide them or avoid them. Remember, it can cause problems later when you do not deal with your feelings. And then take a moment to think before you act. Take a deep breath before responding to something said or done. The other person may not know they have hurt you or offended you. Give them as much compassion as you would give yourself. Manage your stress with tools and techniques that you're learning here. And you wanna strive for balance. Find a healthy balance between your grieving and living in the present. And do your best to focus on positive thoughts in your life. Pay attention to your nutrition. So find some purpose and meaning. Since losing your loved one, you have decided that life is short and you want to honor your loved one. You may realize you want to live much more fully and without regret. That's what we have for our health there. Now we're going to move into our fourth and final health aspect, which is spiritual health. Now I do ask you to stay with me because spiritual health is a personal matter involving values, integrity, compassion that supports the purpose and mission of your life. It can also provide systems of faith, beliefs, ethics, principles, morals, 
And some examples include volunteering, social contributions, belonging to a group, fellowship, optimism, forgiveness, and expressions of compassion. Spiritual health can include a higher power. So it does not have to be God. A higher power is a supreme deity and what explains the unexplainable. Your higher power can offer you peace and rest. I believe we all want a connection to something greater than ourselves. As people, we want to live as good people who treat others with respect, want to be treated fairly ourselves and do what is right. With that being said, I'm offering an acronym of living that sort of life. So G for good. O is orderly and D is direction. I believe we all want good orderly direction. My higher power, I wanna share how my higher power, whom I believe in is God, you don't have to. But I wanna share how my higher power helped me. So the pastor at my son's funeral shared with me, my son was making a choice to take his life and the higher power I believe in was telling him not to. I felt he let my son take his life. It could have been stopped. It was difficult for me to accept until a chaplain shared with me that my son had demons sitting on his shoulders. He was no longer in pain and suffering when he took his life. My higher power let that pain and suffering in. That was a concept I could actually live with. Now, signs. I described a higher power as explaining the unexplainable. In addition to my belief in a higher power for spiritual health, I believe in signs from those who have gone before me. My son has visited me with his presence by leaving signs. Now I missed the first sign my, my son ever sent to me because I was not looking for it. On the day of his funeral, I went for an early morning run. Running has always been an outlet to help reduce my stress, help with my physical and mental. And it was a place to ground myself. And I knew this is where I needed to be. That morning, the sunrise was spectacular. It was one of the most beautiful ones I've ever seen. For a December day, it was an unusually warm day. The wind was still and the sky was filled with cotton ball clouds. As the sun peeked over that horizon, deep shades of orange, yellow, and black reflected off the clouds, intensifying their hue. I stopped my run and stood in awe of the beauty. I took a picture to add my collection of them. If you were ask me one of my favorite things, I would say sunrises. I also shared that love with my son. On that day, he was sending me a message that I would be okay, that he loved me and that sunrises are his way to let me know he was with me. I didn't understand his message then, but I do now. Just a few days ago, I had a client tell me she saw butterflies and it made her think of her mom. It brought back good memories and she really felt comforted because her mom was with her. She knew she was being watched over. You may be a little skeptical about receiving signs and I understand. If you're interested in learning more, read the book Signs by Laura Lynn Jackson and start looking for them. They've helped me tremendously. It's quite possible you have already received signs from your loved one. If you have, type the word yes in the chat box or even feel free to share what kind of signs you've seen. And a resounding yes, I love it. Oh yeah, another message, another response. Yes, ah, pennies, feathers, feathers, dragonflies. Yes, very good. So this is what I have for you on those four aspects of health. We talked about the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. So if you'll allow me to share one more story, 
want to share with you as you're going through your grief, think about a caterpillar. A caterpillar climbs up onto a branch, eats some leaves, and starts to wrap itself up into a cocoon. And in that cocoon, it's dark and it's lonely and he's by himself. And he's in there thinking and morphing. And as he's making those changes, he's feeling his body change. His view is changing. He's thinking that there is something more to the outside of this caterpillar. As he starts to morph, he grows those wings and those wings start to beat against that cocoon. And eventually that cocoon, it breaks out, but that caterpillar who's morphed into that butterfly is now developing strength with those wings. And it's like you, you are developing that strength as you're going through this darkness. You may not see it now, but just like that caterpillar who one day finally breaks free, that those wings are strong enough that they can break free and fly, you too, you can come out of this darkness, come out of this tragedy and find beauty and find light and experience life. So I encourage you to be that caterpillar, caterpillar. So be that caterpillar. Let's go ahead and go on to the next slide then. So you have decisions and choices and what you're doing. So I want to ask you, as you're going through this process, you don't have to do it alone. And you may want to find somebody to walk beside you. So as you're doing that, offering some practical experiences, ask that person who you're considering, do they have that practical experience as they're helping you? Have they lost a child? Have they lost someone to suicide? Do they understand? Have they used the tools they recommend? I've seen others recommend tools and resources that they've never incorporated personally and don't know how to use them or how to customize them. And then finally, we look at, are we passionate about helping others? I've had years of helping others through coaching and 30 years of grieving and healing. And our next slide here, Denise. So because of this, I offer a free grief breakthrough session, giving you that opportunity to connect. So on a scale of one to 10, I like scales if you can't tell, I want you to take a moment and think about this on how ready are you to be able to move through your grief. We don't get over it. Remember, we move through and on that other side, come out like that beautiful butterfly. So on a scale of one to 10, one to three, you're not ready at all. Four to six, thinking you might be ready. And seven to 10, ready and looking for someone to help you. I'll repeat this. One to three, you're not ready at all. Four to six, thinking you might be ready. And seven, 10, ready and looking for someone to help you. I have a five, an eight, a two, a seven. That's awesome. And I understand if you're not ready. But for those who think that you are ready, I encourage you to reach out to me. Because what I would really like to do is give you an opportunity to understand and feel what it's like to not have to do this alone. Because I did this alone with my first loss 30 years ago. 30 years ago, I had my mom and my sister and a chaplain and very limited with that. But I managed to navigate it and you don't have to. It was horrible. And now I'm offering you all my experience. So our last slide here, Denise, we start off our time together by learning about suicide, all of its complexities, messiness and complications with the who, what, when, where, why, and how. We then addressed how to move through your grief by looking at you as a whole person in a holistic manner with four aspects of health. 
physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. I really am truly so sorry you are on this lost journey. That is exactly what it is, a lost journey, a road you always will travel. And now I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. I've got so much more to share. But today, I want to offer you the opportunity to ask me any additional questions. And while you're developing questions, I'll let you know how to reach out to me. You can email me, peggy.griefrecovery at gmail.com. And we'll set up a time to connect and see if this is the way that you would like to move forward. If there is something um, that is time for you to be able to get through this. One of the questions is, how long will I be in pain? Well, it's also relative, and I wish I could give you a very definitive answer, but what happens with that as you start to heal, you may still experience pain 30 years later, like I occasionally do, but it doesn't happen very often. With my daughter, it's less frequent, less intense, but there may be something that trigger it. This was 30 years, so that was for some reason, a little bit more of a trigger, you know, and it's the things that we learn how to navigate and when painful circumstances come up. And that's where I talk about sharing your stories. You know, we didn't talk about affirmations, but that's one, another way to help us to get through that. Um, do I have suggestions for honoring your loved one? Oh, there's so many ways, you know, um, I'll just share the story with my son. And so it took over a year for us to really come to a determination of what to do. And so that means you don't have to decide right away. So this was a memorial that we created for him. He grew up skateboarding and we finally came up with the idea of planting a tree in his honor close to the skate park with a rock as a memorial, you know, and that's one way. Definitely, and there's so many ways, and I can offer you suggestions on this as well. Do um, you ever get over feeling guilty for not knowing? I really wanna spend a moment on this one. I think this is an amazing, amazing question because we're not responsible for their decisions. It's hard for us to not accept that we, and not to know. You know, we have, those who take their lives by suicide, I mean, actor Robin Williams, a comedian, took his own life and he made us laugh and he seemed happy, but he had demons and he was very, very good at concealing those demons. My son, I had no idea. He didn't display particular signs and symptoms of it. And so that's difficult. And when we don't know, we can't take on that responsibility. I like to use a concept called the three C's that you can't control, can't control what they've done. You didn't cause what they did and you can't cure it either. Now, albeit many times when they've got their demons and they make that choice, but it may, we know it's not a healthy choice, but what's going on in their head, you cannot control. And we can only control if you're to put down a circle around you in a three foot diameter, that's what you have control over. So, you, you know, to release yourself of that guilt and understand that was their decision. It takes time to process that. Repeated, most definitely helping you to be able to get through that. And there are support groups where I can be with other people who truly understand what I'm dealing with. And I want to talk about that. And that's another great question. So a word of caution when you get into a support group, whether it be like a Facebook group or um, another type of group where you meet in person, Zoom or whatever. But what I have seen is that in groups without any boundaries, 
or structure or guidelines, what happens is that you can get into a group and initially get the support that you need, which is great because people are caring. Everybody's so caring. But then you may repeatedly tear that Band-Aid off time and time again as you see other people who come in who are just experiencing the new pain, the new loss. So what happens, it inhibits your ability to be able to take that step forward because you continue to feel their pain again and again and again, and you stay raw. Not to say that we don't have compassion for those. So if you're in a group like that, I recommend it to be limited, that you maybe get in and express something that you need, get some support, and then take what you're learning and apply it to somebody else but don't stay and surf those groups for any extended length of time because that's what happens is that they draw you back down as they are drowning in their grief. And it makes it very difficult if you are the one who wants to be able to move forward, that you stay stuck with them. It's hard, it's really hard, but watch shows. And so, and then the other manner then is you can work with somebody like myself, like a grief coach, or actually give you the tools and techniques to help to move through that. And the way I work is that not only through your grief, but these are tools and techniques that you use in life that it helps with that. I have a coworker who won't look me in the eye anymore. How do I broach the subject with them? You know, Child loss creates that elephant in the room. Child loss by suicide doubles that elephant in the room. And really, I think what it takes is being mindful. And sometimes we have to teach others how to help us. So it's taking that moment, setting it aside and just say, you know, I'd like to chat with you for a few minutes. I know this is uncomfortable for you as I'm grieving. What I'd like to do is share with you how you can support me and ask them, say, you know, I'd love to talk about my son, my daughter, my parent, you know, mention their name and allow them to ask questions, ask them questions and say, what's uncomfortable about this and teaching them what you would like. And even if it's something that you go outside and go for a walk and talk about it, or if you need to um, step away, if they understand that and you can just say, you know what, here's my code word, you know, Geronimo, that I need to step away from what I'm doing because something has triggered me. Giving yourself grace to be able to still feel your grief. But I think communication and sharing others. Um, you know, I have something, 21 things to say, not say, or do for those who are grieving. So if that's something that you want, email me as well, and I'll send you out that PDF. And that helps with those circumstances. So what other questions might we have? Just taking a look. Okay. Um, those were the questions that I had. Denise, do we have any others? No, I don't think we do. I, I think you've covered, <clears throat> excuse me, I need some water, I think. Um, <laughs> I, I think we've covered um, most everything in terms of the, the scope of the concept. And I think we've had some great conversation. We've had some great interaction in this. And, um, you know, I, I'm going to encourage anyone who wants to get more information to reach out to Peggy. And uh, we will show her uh, screen one more time for that free grief breakthrough session. And also at the end of this video, you will find the hotline number for the National Suicide Hotline um, that we will add into this as well. So if you know somebody that you, um, you, you want to share that with, please absolutely do. Yes. 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 And I want to thank everyone for attending today, taking your time to really focus on yourself. And if you found this to be helpful, please just share this video, 
because we don't need to go through this alone. And I haven't even been going through it alone as I, excuse me, have I been working through it? I have my support. So thank you.